evening and welcome to this Power Hour event with the Right Honourable David Lammy MP. My name is Kez Dugdale and I'm your host for the next 60 minutes and I'm the director of the John Smith Centre. We exist to make the positive case for politics and public service and we try and do that in three key ways. Through research, studying the relationship between the public and their politicians, through our various internship and development programmes designed to break down the barriers that people face accessing public life and through advocacy with events like these Power Hours. For those joining for the first time, let me explain that our Power Hour series is designed to take a different aspect of power in each event and seek to explore it with a guest who is excelling in their field. Tonight, we are thrilled to host David, and I'd like to invite the principal of the University of Glasgow, Sir Anton Muscatelli, to offer an official, if virtual, welcome. Well, thank you, Kezia, and good evening, everyone. I'm really delighted to welcome you to the latest instalment in the John Smith Centre's Power Hour series. Uh, Kezi and the team have attracted a terrific lineup of guests over the last few months, and I'm pleased to say that tonight is no exception. It's a real pleasure and privilege to welcome the Right Honourable David Lamy MP to the University of Glasgow, and I'm delighted that he has found time in his very busy diary to be with us this evening. David was elected MP for Tottenham in 2000 and rose to serve as a Minister for Culture and then Higher Education within the governments of Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. Today, David is uh, Shadow Secretary of State for Justice within Sir Keir Starmer's team, but perhaps he's best known as one of the UK's most prominent and respected campaigners for social justice and race equality. From his work in the aftermath of the London riots to the Lamy Review and to the experiences and outcomes of BME individuals within England's criminal justice system, to his tireless efforts on behalf of the families of Grenfell Tower and his equally inspiring fight to advance the rights of the Windrush generation, David is rightly recognized as a thoughtful, passionate and committed campaigner. His recent book, Tribes, distills this work and is a story of our times, part memoir, part case study into the UK's increasing political polarization. David's book gives rise to a key question. How do you foster genuine understanding between communities who have little day-to-day -day interaction with each other? Of course, overcoming division is no easy task. Take the pandemic, for example, at a base level, it appears a unifier. No part of the country, no individual has been able to completely evade its grip. And yet the division in outcomes we've seen over the last year has been incredibly stark. Exponentially higher death rates within ethnic minority communities, widespread inequality of opportunity, and a chasm between those able to work from home and others in more precarious employment. Whilst we can't solve all these problems this evening, I look forward to David's perspective on the themes he tackles within his book and his life and his hopes as we begin to build from the, back from the pandemic. David's career will also bring to mind the work we're pursuing across our university uh, around reparative justice and creating a more equitable and inclusive culture. As many of you will be aware, in 2016, the university charged two of our academics with investigating our institutional links to the slave trade and making recommendations for how the university might begin to redress this historic wrong. In response, we've agreed to raise 20 million in funding to a program of reparative justice. And we've signed a, a memorandum of understanding and collaboration with the University of the West Indies to take this forward. And this has led to various initiatives such as the Glasgow Caribbean Centre for Development Research and the Beniba Centre for Slavery Studies. Equally importantly, this has given us extra momentum to our work tackling contemporary issues facing our student and staff populations. From our Decolonized Glasgow Initiative, which is advancing a conversation around institutional decolonization, including within our curriculum, to the recent publication of our report and accompanying action plan into racial harassment faced by our Black, Asian and minority ethnic students on our campus. The university is committed to taking concerted action to advance positive change and further social justice. And if it's possible to sum up David's achievements in just one short sentence, then advancing positive change and furthering social justice seems like a succinct summary. So once again, David, thank you very much for joining our Power Hour. Thanks to the team in the John Smith Center. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. And with that, Kezia, it's back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Anton, for such a brilliant summary of David's work today and for also detailing the action the university has taken to address its history. If you've joined our Power Hour events before, you'll know that we like to start by getting to know our guests a little bit better before discussing their working life and finally their hopes and fears for the future. And you can shape this conversation by posing your questions in the Q&A box at the foot of your screen. That will come through to the team here at the John Smith Centre and I'll combine them with those that have been submitted in advance and I'll try to get through as many of them as I possibly can in the time that we've got with David tonight. 
please note that all of our John Smith Centre Power Hour events are recorded and available to watch again on the John Smith Centre website. David, welcome. There's much we need to cover, uh, including Grenfell, uh, Windrush and your book tribes. But before we get to that, can you tell us a little bit about your early life? What shaped you and who inspired you? Oh, well, um, what shaped me? I think I'm profoundly shaped by having grown up working class in Tottenham. Um, I, what does that really mean? Well, I, I mean, I grew up in Tottenham in those days, there were sort of black Caribbean families. My father arrived in Britain in 1956 my mother a little later in the late 60s um, and then there was second generation like me I mean actually I don't like saying second generation these days because obviously I'm uh, not just British but English in the sense that I was born here but um, but if you if you know what I mean uh, and we grew up with Irish we grew up with white cockneys um, my dad left our family um, when I was 12 I never saw him again um he had a problem with alcohol uh and i suppose he ended up kind of broken really by margaret thatcher it was a very political time uh sus laws tottenham riots so that's what shaped me but i got this break i mean i ended up being a cathedral chorister in peterborough cathedral and i spent seven years at a boarding school there in middle england and there I saw a very different side of Britain, different values slightly, certainly different politics. And I was the odd one out. So I suppose I, I am shaped by understanding that you need to bridge in politics. I'm not just, you know, I don't think I'd be the MP for Tottenham if I hadn't had those seven years in Peterborough, to be honest. Um, so I'm shaped in a sense by those values as well. They're Christian values, they're small conservative values. Uh, but also a powerful sense of injustice. You know, why were we growing up in what people called a concrete jungle? Why were, why is there such discrimination? Um, uh, and look, today we're meeting on a, <laughs> at a time when I've just had a text message from Radio 4 asking if I'll go on the Today programme and talk about Harry and Meghan. So, so you'll understand, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm motivated by that, but also motivated by not having a lot of money and certainly struggling and existing um, or relying at least on um, family income benefits when my father left us. You watched your mum work very, very hard. I think you, you write in your book that she had at least three jobs at, at one point when she was bringing you up. So clearly the work ethic was there, but what, what did you want to be when you grew up? in the circumstances you were living in? What, what did you want to be? There are two things I think that animated me. One was I had this deep fear of prison. And I say that very seriously because so many of the older kids were ending up in jail. They were being, sometimes they were being set up. Often they were falling into crime, but I had a real fear of going to prison. And I also realized I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to have the life of my parents. I, I, I knew that sometimes when I, that my parents were in these sort of professional settings, that people were slightly taking the mickey out of them. So I was out of their accents. They, they were sort of small relative to the, to the bureaucracy they were up against. And I was, I, so I definitely had this sense that I wanted to be somebody. Um, um, I, I wanted to um, have a better life than they had. And um, I realized that the school I went to gave me an opportunity. And I determined basically to take as much from that as I could, despite the challenges that it presented. And taking as much as you could took you to Harvard. How, how, does, how does a boy from Tottenham be the first black Britain to study law at Harvard? Well, it's not as grand as it sounds. I mean, some of your, um, audience will recall that in the 1990s, 80s, late 80s, there was a show on TV called LA Law. <laughs> and it had a young black guy in it and called Blair Underwood, and I wanted to be him. <laughs> 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 and, and, and basically, you know, 
there were some issues at the Inns of Court School of Bar, uh, uh, where you studied to be a barrister in London, that some black kids were taking the school to court because black kids were routinely failing um, and they were claiming discrimination. And I basically thought, how am I better have a plan B? And so my plan B was basically writing off to Harvard to see if I could become an LA lawyer. And Harvard wrote back and said, look, we'd like you to come. And by the way, you'll be the first black Briton to come to the law school. Uh, I said, how much is it gonna cost? They said 45,000, <laughs> I didn't have the money. Um, and I had to bog, bog, you know, beg, borrow and steal the money, but effectively, the Jewish community, um, some Jewish lawyers that I'd worked with came to my aid. I, I'll never forget that. I've always been very close to the Jewish community as a consequence. They could see this young black guy who was going to be the first and they supported me and helped me go to Harvard Law School. So I, I just want to say that, it, you know, I wasn't, you know, it, it came about by accident. And um, of course, going there also had a massive impact. I left Harvard with tremendous confidence. I mean, confidence that effectively propelled me into becoming the, the baby of the House of Commons um, after the death of Bernie Grant. So you go and study law. Did you think then at that point your, your life was going to be in the law? Could you picture yourself as that barrister even when you um, left Harvard? Or do you come back and you, you, you know Bernie Grant already from kind of community connections, but I don't think you were that close. How did you get political and become an MP in your 20s? Uh, so the thing is, I would say I was argumentative and I was small p political, but I wasn't party political. So look, I was, I was, you know, the Tottenham riots, the fall of Margaret Thatcher, the poll tax, the Tottenham three who were in prison for the riots, but, you know, shouldn't have been. Birmingham Six, the Guildford Four. I was coming of age in this very political age. And I went to SOAS before I went to Harvard, which is a very political left wing um, law school. So I, I would say I was, my parents are quite political, actually. Um, you know, they were, they'd come of age during Guyana where they were from the, its fight for independence. So they had a political power, but they were not people who put Labour leaflets on their door. Uh, or drop, you know, I, I was not party political, but I was political. I, so I would say that, you know, in the end, I mean, in fact, when I got into parliament, I've got to say there were these young Turks, the Miliband brothers, Pennell, Balls, Yvette Cooper, uh, Douglas Alexander, there were all these uh, people my age who'd literally been delivering leaflets since they were three, mm. <laughs> come out of university and gone to work for Blair Brown. On the other side, you had Cameron Osborne, you'd worked for Thatcher and others. So I was not that. And I kind of got caught up in that. And people used to say, you know, I'm part, I was never part of that. I, I was always just, you know, it took me a long time. And in fact, I struggled with imposter syndrome, which is something that I think a lot of working class, you know, women uh, can struggle with it. You know, you kind of get there and you think, there are big existential questions about how, you know, am I meant to be here? You know, I'd never been to the House of Commons before I took my seat. <laughs> never been to Westminster. There was no point when you grow up in Tottenham. So, so I, I, I don't want to give the impression it was a, you know, it was easy. I was political and I sort of worked out over time that, look, I had every right to be there. Uh, I, you know, people say you were young when you got to Parliament, you were 27 or whatever, you know, but a lot of my friends from Tottenham had ended up in prison or ended up in mental health. So I had a lot of, my father had left us. So I had a lot of life experience. And I guess at this stage in my life, cause you know, I'm at a place in my life where that, I bring that to bear, but it took me some time to wear that with pride, not with a sort of sense of, oh my God, I've got to hide who I, you know, what my background is. I guess a bit of that story I'm, I struggle with a little bit is, is thinking about, you know, the late 90s and you were elected in the year 2000. How does a guy in his mid-20s at that time, ex having experienced what you've experienced growing up during Thatcher and all the rest of it, how did you identify politics as a force for good, as something that you wanted to be a part of? If anything, your entire life should have been anti-politics the way in its outlook. 
you decided to, to well that's a that's a good very good question i think that's tied up in the fact that look i i don't think had i stayed in tottenham i would be speaking to you to, to do today as a member of parliament it'd be you know i i'd be speaking to you kez because you'd be you know um you know, i don't know um you'd be doing an event around um you know um people who spend time in prison <laughs> It'd be a different event right but i think going to peterborough i saw something there there was an opportunity there and i seized that opportunity and um so i think that that that's the key bit and actually it wasn't anti-political because it was very exciting you know i had you know my family had hoped that um, michael foot would make it in 1983 We'd really, really loved Neil Kinnock. Uh, I'd voted for Neil Kinnock uh, in 92, I remember. And um, I, I, you know, and I was pleased when Tony Blair took over because I thought this guy's going to win. And, you know, I just say this, this is quite political. In all of those elections, 83, 87, 92, you're hoping Michael Foote, Neil Kinnock, second time Neil Kinnock, you know, going to win. There are a lot of wonderful socialist teachers and priests and, you know, white, white people, white liberal or socialist people in my life wanting me to succeed, mentors, some of them, saying, don't worry, they're going to win, they're going to win, Labour's going to do it. And of course, we didn't do it. And what I started to work out was in the end, as much as I, I'm still very good friends with these people and thank you for mentoring me, they were all right when we didn't do it. Because <laughs> they were sort of London bohemian types. You know, black kids like me suffered when there wasn't a Labour government. So I, I was always, um, uh, you know, I understood the power of politics. And for me, it wasn't entirely about activism and street politics it was it was i had a desire to be a professional and i suppose part of that was being being a politician ultimately we're going to get stuck into some of the big political issues that you've grappled with shortly but before we get to that i want to talk about your, your book this is looking a bit like a book festival event now where i slide it into the shop but this is your latest book it's come out in paperback i think this week but it, the headline is it's called tribes and the kind of uh, underline is how our need to belong can make or break society it's not your first book i think you've, you've written about the riots and you've done various other pieces in your time too but can you tell us the the impetus behind this book about identity this book really was therapy. <laughs> um, <laughs> something changed after the referendum in our politics. Uh, perhaps it was also the catalyst of social media, which I write about in the book. But basically, um, you just have to look at the bottom of my tweets to see the hate that's directed at me. Um, you can Google some of the high profile death threats that I've received um we moved into a place of really divisive politics and i'm afraid we also moved into a place where populist figures like nigel farage moved into the mainstream and i would say argue very strongly that there are elements within the current cabinet that really belong in the in the political right fringe i saw that as a direct threat it's really to to who i was and um I wanted to explore the hugely, the huge tribalism that seems to be engulfing our politics, our party politics, the Labour Party veered off um, uh, to some degree towards the hard left, the, the Conservatives towards the hard right, um, you know, and, and the nastiness and the, you know, people would say, why do you hate Britain so much to me. I don't hate Britain. This is why I'm raising my family. Why do you hate white people? My wife's white. <laughs> you know, what are you talking about? But not able to understand that I'm allowed to critique my own country, surely, but not hate that critique. Um, you know, if I did the Today program tomorrow morning on Harry and Meghan, I'm not sure I'm going to accept the invitation. Um, I and and wanted to talk about structural racism as a consequence of that interview, I'd get a lot of abuse, I'd get death threats, and many listeners would assume I hate my country, uh, when all I want to do is make my country better. 
Um, so it was that that drove me to, to write the book. It's when I say it's therapy, it's, it's not, I, I always try and write books that I think that if my mother was alive, she could pick up and read. So they're not academic books, although they sometimes rely on academic ideas. And so the book has got a memoir feel to it. I take a DNA test um, and travel to Niger where my ancestors came from. By the way, I've got, when I took that DNA test, I'm 5% Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> so somewhere someone in that story uh, that I'm so glad has been picked up by the University of Glasgow in the work that they're doing got their leg over. So the book explores all the tribes that make me me. And, and it's a fascinating read and I would genuinely would strongly encourage people watching tonight to, to pick up a copy or, or to listen to it on Audible. You talk a lot in the book about community and I think, you know, scholars watching this are familiar with the idea of communities of place where we share a, a geography. People will be familiar with communities of interest where they're brought together by a particular ideology or an ideal or a belief in a particular subject. But you talk in the book about almost a, a new type of community, which is a community of feeling. I wondered if you could tell me a little bit more about this idea of a community of feeling. That's, that's at the centre of the book, and it's really this idea that um, I suppose as we've become um, hyper-individualised countries, global, globalisation, um, and a sort of souped-up liberalism perhaps dominating, uh, there's something that people feel is missing in their lives. And so they're yearning for these communities of feelings. It was a Italian professor, uh, Mathis Solli, that first coined this idea. And, and you see it all the time, particularly in social media, so that people, people are drawn to, you know, your, your, let's say you're, 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 you're a white young man in a seaside town, not much is going on in terms of employment, uh, those that get to university leave the town they don't go back how you could end up seduced by slightly more extreme views that play to your sense of your belong your need to belong and your need for identity the same thing can happen with a black kid in tottenham who's not got a father perhaps and is seduced into gang culture and peer culture and a, and, a, and a souped up masculinity a lot of it coming from america that makes you feel something and that's important in that world and how you fall into county lines and the drug running and the knife crime very sadly that we're seeing or indeed a young um asian guy who's seduced by an extreme form of Islam. It's the same phenomenon and it's happening writ large. Those are communities of feeling. Um, and we need to, in politics, get into that, understand that more. Um, countries like the UK, um, now, actually, I've got to make some distinction here because this is a sensitive subject. I'm remembering that I'm speaking to the Scottish audience here. But here in England, I think that, um, the business of nation building, what makes the component parts of England is a very, very real issue. Now, I know that devolution has perhaps um, given, there's a powerful, I certainly when I'm in Scotland, I feel a powerful Scottish identity. When I'm in Wales, I feel a powerful Welsh identity that doesn't feel threatened in the way that, you know, I remember when I was uh, much, much younger, uh, you, you know, people would burn down uh, cottages and things in Wales uh, because there was a sense that identity was threatened. But what I'm saying is um, governments have to understand that. They have to understand how you're bringing people back together again. And I talk about in counterculture. And some of that's about nation building. It's things that countries like, say, Canada take for granted, new countries or, or, even, or South Africa. You have to do a lot of work to bring your communities together bit more laissez-faire, I think, certainly here in England. You talk a lot in the book about polarisation. You've, you've touched on it a little bit there. Um, and it's something we think about a lot at the John Smith Centre, especially in the context of um, new forms of media and in particular social media. And in the book, you talk about how we've never been both more connected and more divided. I wonder if you can explain that a, a little bit more to our audience, the sense of 
being surrounded by more people like you and less exposed to people who are different or hold different opinions to you, what that's doing to the very fabric of society. Well, I mean, it, it's we're falling further and further into our own silos. The programs we listen to, the music we listen to, the cliques we occupy, and becoming divorced from people very different from ourselves. It's why, by the way, I deliberately in the book went back to Peterborough and spoke genuinely on, a, on an equal level with people who voted Brexit and have very strong views about immigration, different views to my own, for example. Um, things like the narcissism index going through the roof, you know, this selfie age in which it's all about me, myself and I. Th these are these are big cultural phenomenons that are deeply problematic. Um, you know, the, uh, the we're living in an age of terrible misinformation that's being put out by sometimes foreign, foreign, foreign countries, that we're not gonna mention Russia, um, uh, bots. Um, uh, last week, there was some stuff on deep fakes, you know, a guy that looked like Tom Cruise, but was not Tom Cruise. Um, all of this adds up to a place where we ought to be more connected. We certainly practically are more connected because of the phone, but actually in truth, we are seriously disconnected from one another and 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 i think there are people who really really lose out in the book i i i go to the trial of someone who um sent, sends me and four other mps a death threat to sort of face him down but what i find is a very sad individual who sort of disappeared into a, an extreme world um and you know, the question I'm left with is how do we create a society where that individual could be helped? This is very serious stuff, Kez, because I know you know that that story I tell in the book, very, very sadly, is a similar story that led to the murder of Joe Cox. So this is very, very serious stuff. Oh, it's, it's quite radicalisation. I mean, I, I remember the point in, in, in the book quite clearly and I think it must have taken great strength for you to go to court that day and, and even just put a, a face to the name of, of somebody that had caused such harm. Around about the same point in the book though you also um, retell the story of the kind of rise and fall of multi multiculturalism as a, as a concept something that kind of gathered a lot of popularity under new labour and then came under a lot of attack but fundamentally that was about integration in society. And I wonder just in the context of how polarised we've become, whether you believe it's possible for all that negativity and all that binary polarisation to be undone. What, what might bring us together again? Is it a new form of multiculturalism that kind of is rooted in um, our political identities rather than our cultural identities? Or what is going to take to change this? Look, I think we, you know, let's remember that the new Labour years, we had 10 consecutive quarters of growth. The economy was booming, jobs were there. We didn't quite have full, full, full employment, but we had a lot of employment. Um, everything seems possible when there's money around um, and there's enough to share. And it certainly was possible for New Labour, if you like to expand public services particularly, uh, that was employing a lot of people, you know, in the North, culture was bringing people in, Places like Gateshead having this renewal. Um, uh, we're not in a period of growth. We've just had 10 years of austerity and we're now in a deep recession slash depression, never mind leaving the European Union. And I'm afraid what you begin to realize is that the multiculturalism has got to be more than just samosas and steel bands and celebrating one another in a carnival. Um, actually, and I'm afraid, you know, the sadness, the real sadness following that interview last night is that there are sort of deep questions that remain. And for me, to my mind, a lot of those questions really are about um, our country's past history. And how do I, uh, how, the best way I can summarize that, having lived in America and worked in America, is in America, they do have a strong sense of their past. They fought a civil war, 
uh, to end uh, uh, slavery. Um, and boy, oh boy, they had a battle over ending Jim Crow with um, uh, the wonderful um, Martin Luther King leading the fight. Uh, but their present is contested. In a way, they're still fighting those fights. And there's a refusal to accept some of the real issues that exist for African-Americans in that country um, that played out obviously during the period of Donald Trump and a horrible white supremacy creeping so openly into American politics. I would say here in the UK, the UK has some amne amnesia about its past. <laughs> you know, and actually, let's forget slavery. I mean, it was really interesting during the debate around Brexit to find that there were senior cabinet ministers who seemed not to understand the relationship and the history of, uh, of, of um, uh, uh, England, the UK and Ireland. <laughs> why, why Ireland was separated and some of the painful stories attached to famine and 1922 and, the, and, 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 and all that brought real pain uh, in, in the island of Ireland. Uh, never mind that colonial period that meant that my ancestors were enslaved for several hundred years. Um, and that's real. That leaves a legacy and that legacy is systemic um, racism. And of course it is. You know, for, it, for hundreds of years, people of my colour were considered virtually untouchable, certainly not human beings. And the legacies of that mean that very sadly um, a, a, a child can be born who has a mixed heritage mother and there can be a questioning and a, and a bit of concern that that child is darker. I, what, that's happening in families up and down the country because there's fear attached to being of colour and, um, uh, and status attached to being, to being white. And so Multiculturalism uh, has got to be deeper than just a celebration of each other's country, cu uh, cultures or a community of communities. It has got to genuinely be about unpicking some of those problematic histories. And in fact, tangible things are, for example, what the University of Glasgow is doing, uh, looking at its history and saying, so the best way to put this and I feel you can tell I feel quite strongly about this. If if the 19th century was genuinely about a fight for freedom, and the 20th century was genuinely about a fight for rights, most personified by Martin Luther King, but you could talk about Emily Pankhurst, Harvey Milk, so many people who didn't have rights at the beginning of the 20th century now having rights at the end of it, then it seems to me the 21st century has got to be the century of repair. And that's the conversation we've got to get into if we're genuine about multiculturalism. So on that point about conversations, David, and you touch on this in the book, we're talking about people being in polar extremes, being more divided and more sure of their own righteousness within their own tribes at each extreme of that polarization, less likely to meet each other, less likely to understand each other. And therefore it gets worse and worse. You talk in the book about all the traditional places where we used to meet people who were different from us are in decline, right? So churches, trade unions, youth groups were all places where people could meet people that were different from themselves and their membership is falling. Even in the aftermath of this pandemic, we might find that the traditional workplace is also falling away as a place where you will meet people different from yourself. So I still find myself searching for the solution. Yes. <laughs> Do you have yeah. it? <laughs> Is well, it in your pocket? There's no silver bullet, but let's talk about some of the things I land on. I call it an encounter culture. So I think the minute you, the minute government says, okay, we see this as a problem, get into the business of how we connect people back again, how, how we get people to meet one another again. One of my ideas, and let me just stress, this is my idea, not the Labour Party's idea, <laughs> uh, is a national civic service. Uh, where we actually say genuinely we want young people to meet from different parts of our country to be engaged in service now um, not military service 
uh, that might be right for some, but it's not right for all, uh, but to be engaged in service, a bit like the American Peace Corps or something. And um, because we recognize that actually at the moment we've got university students meeting up, but that's not fair because 50% of students don't meet. And I want kids in Tottenham to have some connection to kids in Sunderland. Um, I talk about what's happened at the local authority level. Um, I mean, I spent some time with Lisa Nandy in Wigan. You know, we've got the same problems, but my God, we're sort of poles apart in a way, a community like Wigan and a community like Tottenham. And, and we've, there's something about local renewal. Um, we call it devolution, but there's a lot to do locally to help people to be connected. It's very hard, you see, to buy into global ideas or even national ideas. If you look around you, your high street's falling apart. <laughs> the council stopped taking the bins out. There are drug addicts under the bridge and no one seems to care. Uh, you know, that is a problem and it's happening too often in significant parts um, of the country. And then I think we've got to have a national mission that we're, buy, we're, 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 you know, we, we're, we're buying, buying back into. It's more, I mean, you know, the government talk, good talk about levelling up, about, a, you know, a, a northern powerhouse, but I, are they really delivering on that? I'm not sure. Okay. We're going to have to move on from the book just just briefly, David. I think we might return to it in in the um, latter sections of this hour that we have in your company. But I know the audience want to to hear you talk about Grenfell and to hear you talk about the work that you've done on, on Windrush. And certainly for me, um, in the book, it was a very memorable section where you talk about waking up one morning and, and both you and your wife's phones have kind of lit up with so many text messages and you discover that the Grenfell block is on fire and that your dear friend Khadija who was on the 22nd floor was in peril you didn't know that her life had been taken at that point we're several years on now from Grenfell but it doesn't feel like justice has in any way um, been served for the, the victims of that but you have always been a strong advocate for the case for state funded housing, right? For, for serious investment in solid homes for people. And I've seen you um, on Channel 4 News and various other places say, if you believe in the welfare state, you have to believe in state funded housing. It's not just uh, hospitals, it's not just teachers. This is the safety net and the safety net must include housing. But my question I would put to you is, how do you convince politicians to do something as difficult and as long term as an, and, and as expensive as building social housing? And they're always going to be so tempted to go for the cheaper, shinier, press release friendly options. Do you know what I mean by that? Like it's, it's easier to say, here's money to help people buy a house or this is what we're going to do to end rough sleeping. The ban on evictions today that we discussed um, earlier, they're all kind of plaster solutions, right? What we need to do is to build houses, but it's the most difficult unsexy thing to convince the public that's required how do you change the narrative on something like that which is so necessary if any progress is actually going to be made yeah that's a big question um now look i around about the time i uh certainly the 90s we were in a place where we were a third, a third, a third. A third of people were renting privately. A third of people broadly were in public housing, socially rented housing, and a third of people were owner occupiers. I'm afraid that that, that has just shifted unbelievably now. Um, the, um, the public housing has fallen through the floor. Um, we have a lot of people in private housing, many of them in really poor um, accommodation and um, owner occupation has stalled, but is still present in, in, in the system. But what you see is, um, and it creates mass, massive problems. We have an asset class, particularly of people in London and the Southeast, but that would also be true of desirable um, places to live. And I've certainly, uh, you know, visited friends in Edinburgh and thought, oh, I'd like to live here. <laughs> so there are these little pockets and bubbles um, and it's an asset class because the people that own those homes are usually in a certain generation. 
they are baby boomers or they're Gen Xers like me, um, who are now in their late 40s or 50s. Um, and there's no way that millennials or Generation Y have any chance of getting on the housing ladder. Um, and unless their parents are wealthy and they're leaving them some sort of inheritance, and even then it's unlikely they'll be able to move into the places that they grew up in. Uh, and then we're not building public housing. Uh, we, there's no commitment to public housing. Um, and there actually isn't a cross party consensus any longer on public housing. Um, I, it was really depressing. I, you might remember a few years ago, there was um, so, sort of leaks that demonstrated that George Osborne and David Cameron took the view that these are not our voters. Why would you want more public housing? Um, and I, rem I, I, I remember that an era in which you, you moved into your council flat with pride that you had a council flat. Um, so we've got problems because the truth is there will all, there, there are gonna be significant groups of the population who cannot afford to buy their own homes, um, uh, who cannot be just left to Rachmanite landlords and the public sector has got to be involved. And we're still in an era where the public sector has left building homes. And if I'm afraid you leave it to just the five major big property developers across the country, inevitably what you'll find is, um, is I'm, I'm afraid it's not in their interests to, to have those homes because they want the prices to stay up. So there isn't a consensus. Um, I, I now feel certainly for those who are in the more progressive place in politics, more socialist place in politics, it was always education that animated us most you know that was the big driver for social change but you know i'm beginning to see time and time again and this really came across with grenfell that you know if you if you've got nowhere to go back to and actually study if you're sharing a cramped flat with you know two three brothers and sisters and your single mum um we're really really failing and what, what I remember that I did an interview after Grenfell and I broke down in tears. Um, and it was really, I was thinking of my friend Khadija Say who lost her life. Uh, she lived on the 20th floor with her mother. Uh, Khadija, and I was thinking, uh, Khadija was like me, you know, young, uh, ambitious, uh, but from a poor background. And there's something about the way in which when you come from a working class background, when someone in a suit, or someone in a uniform tells you to do something, you do it. And Khadija rung up, she'd smelt smoke, she knew the building was on fire, and she was told to stay put. And she stayed put. And that killed her. Had she left when she smelled the smoke, she'd still be alive today. And it's a, a, a why I got upset is because it's the agency that, you know, that belief that the state will be there for you that need to have a state that cares about you, that needs to listen to you when those people were complaining about the cladding and the problems in there. We've lost that as a society and we desperately need to get it back, desperately. David, don't you think young people now, they still aspire to own their own homes? They don't aspire to live in a council flat or in social housing. Is the aspiration wrong? Should we be telling a whole generation property ownership isn't, isn't going to be for you. I mean, that's got such a negative construct to it. I wonder is well, there a way of talking like they do in Germany, where the, you know it, people don't own their own houses predominantly in Germany. They they believe in this wider sense of society and, and renting and the security that comes with that is backed up by the state. Is, is Britain ever going to be ready for a system like that? Intellectually and economically, you can't divorce housing and public housing policy from the broader economy. So what I said in my answer was that we've created an asset class. Um, now, and if you're in that asset class, great. If you're not, life's quite hard. Until you're thinking about what kind of economy do we really want? And this gets back to zero hour contracts. It gets out you know, to, to very precarious work, the gig economy. Um, huge sectors of the economy, like the service sector, which are not unionized at all. Um, then, of course, of course, there'll be that aspiration to own your own home because that means something. 
uh, Germany's not like that. The Scandinavian model is not like that. Holland is not like this. So some of this about is the is the is the central discussion about the kind of economy that we believe we need and where the balance is. And if you are serious about leveling up, um, we're going to have to get into this in a very serious way over the next few years. And my view is, don't expect Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak to fix this problem. They won't. So from that party political advert, we're just going to move on to the, the, the topic now of, of Windrush, David. And we do have some audience questions um, for for you. We've got about 15 minutes left of this event, so there's still plenty of time for people to put in questions if they haven't already. But one here, David, for you. Do you think there have been any positives to come out of the Windrush scandal? Keeping in mind the Windrush Day grant, the Windrush compensation scheme and the establishment of Windrush Day. Uh, any positives? I'm afraid I said it was a, it was a national day of shame. Um, I'm afraid the compensation has been not sufficient for the damage that was caused. Uh, of course, I celebrate a Windrush Day, but it slightly gets back to what I was saying before, that multiculturalism can't just be about a day when we celebrate uh, West Indian and Caribbean communities. If there's still structural racism in our society, that means that we're prepared to deport, detain um, and deny people housing, pensions and health care as a consequence. So I think um, I've got to tell you uh, that that story still being written and there's much, much more to do. We've got another question here, which is linked in the sense that it's about undocumented nationals. And it says, with increased conversations about vaccine passporting, how do we ensure that undocumented nationals are able to access key services? It's a really, really good question. Um, there's been a lot said about vaccine hesitancy um, uh, in particularly Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. But you will know that some of that is entirely about people who were very, um, far from being able to access services because of their status in this country um, and the position that someone like Priti Patel takes on these issues. Um, uh, unfortunately, immigration remains a very vexed discussion um, here in England particularly. Um, so there are no easy fixes on this, but perhaps because I think there's a, a, a national understanding that we do need uh, people to feel able to take up the vaccine. It's in all our national interests for that to be the case. We might have to relax some of that attitude. But, you know, I, I hoped that we might see a different attitude to our nurses and some of our key workers as a consequence of this pandemic. And I think we saw in the decision of the government just a few days ago not to, you know, to give them a 1% pay rate, but that may not be quite the case. So. Um, we live in hope. I want to um, move on from that to the, the kind of topic of representation in, in, in public life. And another thing that struck me from your book was you, you talk about the litany of government reviews that have taken place throughout your time in office. And, and one thing you've noticed, which admittedly I, I hadn't, but I'm glad that you did, is that whenever there's been a big failing of public policy and there's a big dramatic government um, review or independent judge-led review, they're always led by white, middle-aged, middle-class men. And uh, I, I wonder if you think there's something that the government can do about that. Do you think they should set out now to stipulate that any big investigations such as what's happened around COVID need to be led by somebody that doesn't look like the government of the day? Yeah, I mean, when I raised issues about uh, Morbic leading the... Um, Grenfell inquiry, it was really to say, um, not of course that you can't be white middle class man and, and lead an inquiry. The Scarman uh, inquiry into the Brixton riots um, was well thought of. McPherson inquiry into Stephen Lawrence Merson was very, Lawrence murder was very well thought of. But it's simply to say, are there any women ever? <laughs> um, I was sort of thinking that in my mind because if you, I think if you're a woman who's given birth in a public hospital, you know something about really, you know, you're in the hands of the state, <laughs> a bit like being in social housing. Um, 
you know, and certainly if you're a minority, you know something about that. So um, I don't know if you can set a target on that, but I wanted to kick off a discussion about who who gets to who gets to inquire, um, and why is it? I mean, I qualified now as a lawyer. 25 years ago, um, I, I know lots of minority lawyers. Why can none of these people ever be appropriate to be a judge or to lead an inquiry? That was the conversation I wanted to kick off. So, so let's just keep that going for a, a, a bit longer because some of that is about the pipeline, right? So it's literally about the number of people of color or the number of women or the number of disabled people who reach the higher echelons of a particular vocation, whether that be the law or whether that be politics. But then there, there's another barrier, isn't there? There's another ceiling within that where you don't quite make it into the absolute upper echelons of that, where you become the judge that does that particular exercise. And I just wonder that if you had a magic wand or if you were sitting in you know, number 10 or number 11 Downing Street tonight with all the power that comes with that at your disposal, what, what your manifesto might be to tackle the underrepresentation, particularly of minority ethnic communities in Britain in positions of power? Whether that be directly well, in, in my in my review uh, into the criminal justice system, I did call for targets, targets for our judiciary, targets for our prison officer officers, uh, unconscious bias training for it to be properly monitored, um, and for people to be held to account. Um, that's what I called for. I, I don't think these things happen by accident. And, you know, you can, you know, we now have in Parliament, I've seen it change over the years. We've got this, you know, the Parliament that I stepped into did not have the number of women MPs that we've got today. Uh, we're making better policy as a result. That was because of all female, women shortlists. It was deliberate policy. You had to intervene to create the curve, to create that environment. Uh, uh, and I'm afraid if you don't do that, either with targets or ultimately quotas where it's not happening, power always shifts back. It always shifts back to those who traditionally held it. And, you know, Martin Luther King taught us this. No one gives up power lightly. <laughs> you have to take it. You really have to take it. When you've got it, you've got to hold on to it. Um, so um, I think that um, to, and, and it's not, you know, often we're getting past this pipeline business. There are loads of ethnic minority lawyers. They do apply to be a judge. They never just don't get interviews or don't get through. Um, often you find that, you know, there are loads of women stepping up and ready, but they're never quite ready. And you're always talking, just, just hold on, your time will come. Don't just wait. It's always the, it's always the way of those who really seek to support the status quo and to keep things as they are, and you have to push and chop. But what excites me is I do think that um, this younger generation of millennials and Generation Y, they've sort of had enough of this. They're tired of it. They're a big generation like the baby boomers. They're not quite got their hands on the levers of power, but soon when they do, things are finally going to change. We've, we've had an interesting uh, question which is connected to that, David, and it's about these huge challenges that you've just described, and, and the question is very simple. It says, is politics up to the task? Because you talk about young people there, and you, we've done some research at the centre recently showing that um, young people are more likely to be distrustful of politicians and people in power than their elder counterparts might be. And we've seen things like you know, the, the climate change protesters, Extinction Rebellion, seeking to disrupt established forms of power rather than to be part of it in order to change things. Is politics as we know it up to the huge challenges that face it's us? It's got to be, because it's the only thing we've got. Guess <laughs> what are we going to do? Well, I, I mean, agree, it, but it, defend it. I, think do it, defend I, it? I do think in an age of populists, um, it, there is problematic because they, you know, they're quite happy to leave people who out of the tribe. They're not governing for everyone. They're governing for the tribe that keep them in power. So I do think, I do recognize that problem. I also think that um, we've got to be a bit careful about an era in which um, social media can give the impression that politics is immediate, that protesting is a tweet, mm. that justice is achieved, uh, you know, in quick time and it's not 
you know, so we've got to step back and learn from the Emmeline Pankhurst, the Gandhis, the, the, the Mandelas. This is a long haul. This is a long struggle. Get real. Um, you know, and this immediacy, uh, it doesn't quite work like that. Um, so there's a bit of me that, it, 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 you know, um, this, what we've got is democracy. What we've got is um, a system where we arbitrate and negotiate our differences in a democratic way. Uh, and um, we lose that at our peril. We saw recently in the United States what happens when you start to um, throw that under the bus, basically, with that storming of Capitol Hill. And we've had in our, in, here with the prorogation of Parliament uh, some of the really quite, I think, quite shrill, narrow rhetoric around immigrants. Uh, we're seeing some of that tendency here as well. Uh, it's got to be resisted and fought, and it's and that's what that's what animates you. That's what motivates you. That's it's got to. We've got five minutes left, David. So I'm going to give you some quick fire questions now, and they're not linked. I'm not even going to attempt to do handbrake turns from one to the next. So let me start with this one. Looking ahead, there's a scenario of a growing Little England mentality, hostile to all that's around it. Or there could be one of participating in big global issues like climate change. Which one is a more realistic scenario? And what does that mean for social polarisation in Britain? Oh, look, I think uh, the climate emergency is everything. Um, it's got to animate everything. We have an opportunity now that Joe Biden's in the White House um, with Kamala Harris. Um, uh, Glasgow is a big moment that requires leadership. I hope and pray that Boris Johnson steps up to the plate, but I'm hugely, hugely pleased that Joe Biden's there to kick him into the right places if he's not there, if he's not quite there. We've got another one here. Thank you for sharing your experiences. So insightful. What advice would you give to a young black person interested in public office? but discouraged and disappointed when they see the racist abuse that someone with your profile or Diane Abbott, et cetera, gets when they have to face that in social media. Should you social can't media not. do more, sorry, David, should social media do more to regulate their platforms to protect people and their mental health? And if so, how? Yes. Uh, I, I don't like anonymity on social media, by the way. Um, uh, I, I think fines have got to be there in a bigger way. Uh, there are countries like Australia, Germany beginning to lead. We're still waiting to see uh, the online harms bill here. Um, and I worry that some of these companies are funding political parties and we're not going to see the action that we need. But what I would say to you is, look, if you want to be in public life, you've got to get resilient. Um, uh, I'm sure you'd say that to them as well, guess is the truth. And my mother used to always say, uh, whenever I'd get downhearted, live up to your ancestors' prayers. And that was to remind me that however tough I think I'm finding it, my answers found it a hell of a lot tougher. Come on, get real. And that doesn't matter whether you're working class and you were down a pit or, or, or you know, on the factory floor or in the steelworks or whether you were black or brown or whether you're a woman or whether you were LGBT or whether you have a disability. Um, for so many of us, however hard we think it is, live up to your ancestors' prayers. They prayed that you would be here um, to continue the fight and have much more opportunity, however tough it is, than they had. I mean, that, that is so powerful and so inspirational, David, but can I challenge you just a little bit on the point- Go on, about, yeah. On, just a little bit on the point about resilience, because if you don't mind me saying, what makes your, you so good at highlighting the injustices that you've seen, particularly on Grenfell, you know, and on Windrush, was that you showed that you were hurt, that, that you were emotional, that you could empathise with those experiences. And I worry sometimes when we tell people to be resilient, that they could become so resilient and so hard skinned that they lose that ability to feel, which makes you good at your job. Would you, would you accept that? I do. <laughs> I'm not saying become, you know, uh, lose your humanity. And I've always worn mine on my sleeve. Um, you know, I've struggled with my own mental health points. I talked about having an imposter syndrome um, when I was younger. Um, so I'm not talking about, but I'm saying that you've got to be up for the fight. Uh, 
And I suppose the bottom line is I know where I stand in the ground. I know what my bottom line is and what my comp what compromises I'm prepared to make. Uh, my wife's a portrait artist. She sometimes talks about looking at people when they get into politics and they're looking at you square on. And by the time they're leaving politics, they're sort of speaking outside <laughs> of their mouth. And that's what I'm not prepared to do. So yes. that when I say resilient, it's knowing who you are, really, and who you stand for and what your bottom line is. I think that's a really great point of clarification and also a fabulous point to stop, David. That's been just fantastic to spend 60 minutes in your head, really. And I think that um, if people want to spend more than 60 minutes in your head, they should read your book. Because, <laughs> or, or listen to it actually because there's so much more to it than, than what we've been able to um, cover tonight if I can say to everybody that, that Tribes is out on paperback um, this week and that if you enjoyed this particular Power Hour all our past Power Hours are available on our website and um, we've got quite the back catalogue now so you can spend endless hours going through those and to those people who are still with us if you would like to shape who we hear from next at the John Smith Centre then please uh, complete the super quick evaluation form which is about to appear on your screen. And if you don't fill it out just now, it will arrive in your inbox tomorrow. So there's no escape. The feedback that we get from these events is always really positive, but it's also really nice to be able to share it with our guest speakers who have given us so much of our time. So all that's really left for me to say as we hit the hour is thank you so much, David Lamy. Thank you, Sir Andrew Muscatelli for giving us the official welcome tonight. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye for now. Thank you so much, it's great.